start, I saw that not everybody has put their bags under their seat. Would you please do so? Because it's quite dangerous. Um, we also have uh, our security coordinator sitting in this room and uh, the exits are over there. Uh, in case the farm, a fire alarm goes off, it's over there. Please slowly follow him. He will switch on the lights and please stay calm. Don't panic. So, about seven years ago, I was, a, I was a young, promising designer, and I was doing what I loved most, which was working in sustainable design. I was traveling throughout the world, going from Kenya to Vietnam to Mexico, and I was fo really following my passion. Until one morning, right after the holiday, I went out on the street to go and work again, and I cracked. I literally cracked. Everything got fuzzy in front of me, and I had the feeling that I couldn't breathe anymore. So I thought, okay, maybe I should go back inside again and wait a little bit. You know how it is when you start working again after holiday. But the morning became a day, and a day became a week, and the week became a month. And by that time, I had figured out that I had quite serious panic attacks and also a form of agoraphobia, so afraid to go out in the streets. It was uh, the worst period in my life, but also one of the best periods in my life, because it taught me two things. Um, when I went out again on the street, I could really feel the rain again, for example, and it, and it, it made me realize that I, before I was very ungrounded. And it also made me realize I needed these physical surroundings to really um, feel life again. So about this ungroundedness, um, the, the, about this ungroundedness, um, uh, uh, about the... Um, uh, see, this is what happens when you have a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I'm so spoiled, I have everything in the world, because I come from a very rich country, uh, I'm doing the things that I love, and still, what's happening to me? But I realized that uh, I had a lack of foundation, and that was based in a fear mindset. And this fear mindset is something that's also very much present in our society today. So that's what I want to share with you. So about retouching physical things, that's what helped me to be grounded again. And um, that's also what I, why I started designing in the first place, because design is actually about creating something that you have in your mind into something very tangible, something physical. And design also is about experimenting and acting, and uh, it has something very positive intrinsically in itself, because you have this idea that you want to create a better future. So it's actually a very nice thing to do. And after my um, fear period, I also realized that you didn't even need to do that with physical things. You could also do that with uh, non-tangible things, so with uh, processes or strategies. So that design thinking became my job. And that's what I'm working in right now. So I work in a very nice design office in Eindhoven, and I also work at the university there. And we solve social projects by design. So about three years ago, the city council of Eindhoven came up to us. And they said, hey, you are the creative people. We have a lot of problems that we don't know how to solve. Maybe you can help us out. And one of the things, and you, now you have to know something about Eindhoven. Eindhoven is very high on the uh, crime ranking list in the Netherlands. 
due to it has a lot of um, uh, nuisance like uh, high impact crimes like uh, molestation, theft, uh, demolition, assault, these kind of things that also touch your perception of safety. So they asked us, um, we have a problem with about 40 youth groups in the city and they're turning into gangs. Maybe you can help us out. A lot of tension was built up around them. So instead of doing a big analysis, we just went out there in a designerly way. So as a kind of user tester would do. So um, in one of the, we selected two locations. In one of the locations, we just went up to the gangsters and we started conversations with them. And one of the, the kids or the teens said, you know, I'm sitting in this square because my home is over there and um, my school is over here. And when I go from school to home, this square is just in the middle and the supermarket is behind it. I can buy a drink and it's such a nice square to sit in. So um, we realized that was quite a mature and, and non-gangster thing to say. So maybe there was not such a problem with them. Maybe, maybe the problem was somewhere else. And then we looked up and we saw that uh, the audience, the, the uh, upstairs, there were a lot of apartments for elderly people. And they were kind of the audience looking down on what you could say was the stage. So the square was actually functioning as a stage and the elderly were uh, in the, you know, Waldorf and Stettler from The Muppet Show, those old grumpy guys. So that's what the elderly were. And this, uh, there was a lot of tension built in the last five, ten years around this um, square. So instead of going to, uh, to up to the kids when something was wrong, the elderly would immediately call the police. And that's where all the complaints came from. So what we did, in a, as designers, we thought, okay, we have to restore the communication between these two uh, parties. And um, we did that by making a device for a mobile phone. So with a kind of agenda of the square, so they could both claim their space. Because we were thinking they're both entitled to have that space, because that's what public space is about. But when we showed it to the elderly, they didn't want to use it. And um, it made me think a lot, but I also realized a lot of things about being older in the Netherlands, because there are a lot of things that have changed in the past 10 years. They used to have a fixed pension, everything was secured, and now it's not anymore, because they, they're doing all these cutbacks. So that made them feel insecure. And then there's another thing, our society is also not so friendly towards elderly, because so much evolves around having a job that once you're retired, you feel very useless. So this insecurity and the usefulness made them feel defeated. And this defeat caused them, uh, caused this passive attitude. So what we had to do was not make some communication tool, but we just had to give them the feeling that they could react again. And the designers that were involved in uh, executing the project on the square just started to organize things, organize some series of events. And by doing that, they gave those elderly the feeling that they were part of something again. We knew they cared because that's why they filed all the complaints. But now they had to care in a more active way. So we restored the interaction on the square and that was the action, was the, 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 the main source that helped us out. And it also made us realize that we had to interact, we had our, to engage ourselves with the context. So, a second example, also in Eindhoven. And now it's about the nightlife there. Um, imagine that you're a girl, about 17 years old, and uh, you're living in a suburb of Eindhoven. If you want to go out and it's quite boring in Eindhoven sometimes, where do you go? You go to Stratums Eind. It's the place to be. Because it has 62 bars, and you can hop from bar to bar. 
And that's what girls do. So if I would be a girl, I would be on my bike on Friday evening, 9, 10 o'clock. I would meet some friends halfway on my route to the city center and then uh, meet more friends at the first bar, have a lot of drinks, a lot of beer for a very few little er, euros. And then I would dance a little bit, see some guys, and at the end of the evening, a bit wobbly, but I would ride back home again. So, now imagine that you're the parent of one of these girls. And keep in mind, because they also have this crime ranking list, you know, of all the assaults and the theft and the, everything that goes wrong, because it concentrates around stratum science. What do you do as a parent? So first you offer like, hey, maybe I should drive you to the city center because it's much more safe. But as a girl, you would say, hey, come on, I'm cool. You cannot bring me. That sounds stupid. So uh, in, instead, as a parent, you would say, uh, but at least you have to text me regularly throughout the evening because then at least I know that you're safe. And the third option you would do is just say, hey, a give a restriction, you have to be home at 2 o'clock. But for the girls, for a girl involved, that feels very controlling and even a little bit manipulative, while you are actually, as, as a 17-year-old, you're looking for freedom and you're looking for your identity to express yourself. So in a worst-case scenario, you just go out there, say yes, but you would go and just do your thing without texting so your parents would be very worried uh, until the moment you got home. But there's a big distance to bridge. And uh, when we joined the girls, because we joined them to go out one evening, we found out that there's not only a miscommunication with the parents, but the girls are actually not doing so much wrong also. Girls are, in general, quite responsibly. So there was also not really a problem with them. We found out that 75% of all the incidents around Stratum's Eind were happening between boys. So, but we did see, we went back to the girls, and we saw that the girls who had the most trouble with their parents had parents who lived very far from the city center of Eindhoven. So those girls had to bridge a long distance. But the parents also had to bridge a long distance because they especially moved into the suburbs because they wanted to live in a more quieter, greener area. And by doing that, they didn't they lost touch with the city center, and they also lost touch with their daughters. So they also had a lot of mental distance to bridge. So what did we do? What, we, what it taught us is that we shouldn't solve the problem at Stratum's Eind. So you could put more cameras to keep the girls safe, but that was not a problem. The problem was a problem about perception. So what did we do? Um, we, first, we tried to put things in perspective for the parents. So we said, hey, now it's Stratum's Eind where your girl is going, but next year she will probably, she will be 18, so she will go to Spain. You better get used to this now. And the second thing that uh, we found out is that girls um, and parents could gain more trust or ha have a better bond together uh, if they spend not more quality time together, but just do the normal things a little bit more. So a, a daughter feels, if she doesn't feel, uh, if there's no pressure or she doesn't feel uh, controlled, then she, sh she starts talking about what she's doing every day, which boyfriend she has and what she likes or doesn't like. But if you make that too controlled, they don't do that. So we made this very small device that could help parents keep track of those normal moments, like doing the dishes or going to the groceries. So what I'm explaining is also the way we approach problems. And what designers do is that we engage ourselves in the context. 
We also always want to find out what motivates people. But in this case, we also needed to step back. So we needed to find out what the context of the problem was in order to really understand it. And by understanding the context and walking a little bit around the problem, that's how we solve them. And that's what these two examples show. So, what I want to say is that design can really bring something for these kind of security or safety problems. But until now, everybody's always looking for countermeasures, you know, like more fences, more cameras, more walls. And on the other hand, there's also a big plea for more openness, uh, like more social cohesion projects. But that wouldn't have helped the mindset of the elderly, and it also wouldn't have helped the bonding between the parents and the girls. And it's a little bit, it made me think about my own experiences with my fears, that after a week of panic attacks, I went to the doctor, or the doctor came to me, and the doctor said, uh, maybe I can prescri prescribe you some Prozac, because Prozac also helps for panic attacks. And there were also people in my environment who said, hey girl, you just have to go out there, it's just a matter of doing. But the funny thing is, all these um, measurements, they all talk about the symptoms, they don't talk about the cause. And I think the cause is the inability to deal with fear and risk. Because we are living in a very risky society, and this risk causes insecurity and causes fear. If you look at the news now, about 50% of all the news messages are some way about fear. So that's actually something that we're all living with. And we are living in a very insecure society because a lot of things are really changing. It's not that your pension is fixed again anymore and uh, a lot of things have become really more fluid. So instead of working on spending all this money on countermeasures, maybe we should just learn to live with the fact that things have become fluid and insecure. So I'm not, um, my, my talk is not a, uh, a plea for more action or uh, just doing things and that will help you out. But I do think that um, by, by reacting and by learning how to cross uh, these mental distances, this can help you out. And also then taking a step back, taking a step back and walking a little bit around the problem, because that can really help you to work things out. So we are living in very dynamic times. And our, our present institutions are just not capable of dealing with that. So we have to reinvent ourselves how we have to uh, deal with this insecurity. And that's something like crossing these mental distances, um, acting again and taking a step back. That's something we can all do. It's not something that only designers do. And I think we will really need it. But that's what I wanted to share with you. <laughs> Thank you very much.